I have been talking about Synology 10 gigabit networking and I feel that this is a good time to talk about a 10 gigabit switch. In my research, what I found, what are some that I would consider, some that I buy that didn't work and the one that I'm using now. So let's find out together. I'm Art and Art is right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. This is a continuation of my 10 gigabit networking series. I've done a lot of research and testing, and if I could save you some time along the way, this would be fantastic. Let's talk about networking switch that can do 10 gigabit. There are many of them in the market, some that starts at the lower 100th price range to one that goes up to thousands of dollars. We're going to focus on more the lower end because I really only need 10 gigabit networking for a few of my systems, no more than four, and that is with future expansion. So let's talk about some of the system I consider, why I decide to not buy it, some of the ones that I did get in the studio that didn't work really well, and the one that I'm using now. And I'll share with you the rationale behind all of those. Starting out for 10 gigabit, Netgear is one of the brands that I did look at and consider. This is the GS110EMX and it runs about $250. I think this is fairly pricey. It has two 10 gigabit port and is 10 base T, meaning that you can use a CAT6 or above patch cable and run it through copper networking, which is great. However, it does limit you with regards to how you can connect the 10 gigabit device to your network. That means you have to use a copper cable only. You can't just use an SFP plus module or a fiber cable on this. What I like about this though, is that it has eight gigabit ports and this will allow me to connect my other devices that are still running on the non 10 gigabit to this without any problems. This is a switch that will fit my minimal needs, meaning that I need one computer to link directly to my NAS via the switch and this will work just fine. However, this does not offer room for any type of future expansion and is one of the reasons why I decide not to go with it. And another thing too, as I mentioned before, is that the price point, I don't think it represents a good value. So now another brand I consider was the Mikrotik and there's two models that I was looking at. One of them is this one that you're seeing on the screen right now, which is the CRS305-1G-4S plus IN. The first port there is a 10 base T and it allows for PoE in so you can power it using a PoE switch. I don't have that so kind of null and void there but I can power this with a power adapter so that's not a problem. The rest of these ports are SFP plus which offer me the flexibility because I can get a module that will take fiber connection or I can get a module that will take 10 base T so you can use any patch cable cat 6 or above to run your networking on copper. This will work. However, each of these modules costs anywhere between 30 to 80 bucks and even more depending on the one that you get and the type connector and the brand, so on and so forth. So when you're getting this switch, you're also having to consider the price of these SFP plus connectors that you have to get and add on to it as well. This switch runs around 150 and it was one that I was really looking at it. The thing about Mikrotik is that they make two lines of switches and this is from what I've gathered so far. The CRS line is more of their pro line. It uses more of the pro S, allows you to go in and dial in a lot of controls. Another one is their CSS line and it's more of their consumer OS side. So they use the switch OS, which is not really a robust operating system at all, or the firmware web interface operating system is not really good. And this would take our discussion to the next Mikrotik unit, which I purchased in the studio, ran some testing on it, and have to return it because of the bug in their software. This is a CSS610-8G-2S plus IN. This is very similar to the Netgear switch that I showed you earlier. It has 8 gigabit port, and for the 2 10 gigabit one, it has SFP+. At $99, I mean, it's a really great switch for the price. However, it's using SWOS, which is a very consumer-based OS, doesn't allow you a lot of controls, and there are a lot of bugs in the OS. But with this switch, even if you have to get two of these SFP plus modules, it's still going to be cheaper than the Netgear switch and does represent a much better value. However, the reason I have to return it is for a few things. So when I was testing this a few months ago, there are a few bugs in their SWOS, which I'm not sure if they have ironed these out yet or not. Well, one of the bugs that really concerns me is that the switch would still continue to route traffic between different devices on my network. However, when I try to run a network scan or go into my main router, none of those devices or none of the network scan can see the switch. That means the IP address doesn't show up, whatever, it just shows up as empty. And there's something weird going on there and that's not okay. If I restart the switch, it will pop up on my network, but only for a little bit and then it will drop out again. 
If I have a computer that's linked up to this switch hardwire using a 10 gigabit port, I can't just log into the switch OS or the SWOS from my computer because there is a bug that's preventing that from working. And again, that's one of those not okay things because if I have to run just a regular gigabit connection onto my computer as well, that kind of defeats the purpose or run Wi-Fi and hardwire. So even though this switch represents a good value, the OS for this is really buggy. And if you're looking at this switch, I would highly caution you against buying it as of now until they have resolved the software issue. So if you're looking at Mikrotik, one of the things I probably recommend is to look at their CRS line, which is more their pro line, which is supposedly a more robust testing for their operating system versus the CSS line, which is not as robust at all. And like I said, these bugs are not okay. And this leads me to find another switch that is better suited for my needs and what I want and still giving me the future expansion. The brand I ended up finding was QNAP. This is a competitor to Synology. They make a lot of NAS as well, but they really make a lot of these awesome 10 gigabit switch. From my research and testing and also using them, it's been extremely reliable. It works really well. And the GUI, I'll tell you this, from QNAP, on their switches is much better than SWOS on the Mikrotek CSS line. So that's another thing to consider as well. They do cost a little bit more than the Mikrotek one, but I mean, their system does offer a lot of flexibility. So they make the managed series as I'm showing you here, the QSW. They also have the QSW unmanaged series 10 gigabit and 2.5 gigabit. Because I'm sending massive amount of data to the network, I want the data to go from one place to the next and go exactly where it needs to go without a lot of interference or data bouncing around. This is why I'm choosing to get the Mana switch. The line that I end up choosing to go with is their QSW M408. And there's three models in this lineup. Let's start with the base model, the QSW M408S. Pretty much the specification across all these lines are very similar. The only difference is the way how the 10 gigabit ports are configured and they all come with four. They also all come with eight gigabit ports, which allow me to link my old device to it. So it works fantastically well. The base one comes with four SFP plus, meaning that you still have the flexibility choosing between copper or fiber connection, but you do have to get these SFP plus module, which does add cost per each connection. The one that I end up adopting for my studio is the QSW M408 2C. This one, the four SFP ports are still there and two of them also has a dual port, meaning that you can run either a copper base or an SFP module inside, giving me even more flexibility. So for instance, my Mac Pro is linking with this switch using the regular copper connection, while the other one for my Synology, at one time I was running on the Mellanox Connect X3 SFP Plus and I was using this 10 gigabit fiber connection for it. Right now in my Synology NAS, I'm using one of the Synology card that has a 10 base T and also the PCIe card has two slots for NVMe SSD for caching. So I'm back to 10 base T and this is giving me the flexibility to use just a regular copper connection without having to buy an extra SFP plus module and those are used up already. But I also still have two SFP plus port that I can use for future expansion. I can get one of these modules or I can use a fiber connection, which I do plan to add another NAS in the future, and I'll probably be using the Mellanox card for that. And sitting at the very top for this lineup is the QSW M408-4C. With this one, all the 10 gigabit ports, you have a dual connection. You can choose to use SFP or a copper-based connection. The thing about this one is that it adds about $100 of pricing on top of the 2C model. And I feel that for me, the 2C model is one of those great compromise where I have a few of these SFP plus modules lying around, so I don't really have to worry about getting them. And if I have to buy one or two in the future, I can still find one. And I think that would still get a better pricing than trying to go for the one that has a dual connection for both, some of which I'm not gonna be using right away. So anyway, I hope that you find this guide on choosing a 10 gigabit networking switch for your small office or home studio helpful. If you have any questions or comment, leave them below. Give this a like, subscribe if you're new, hit on the bell to be notified. And until next time, in Art We Trust.